straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. Prosecutors will seek the death penalty for Chad Daybell if convicted in the murders of two children and his wife. How this impacts the upcoming trial of one of the Doomsday Duel defendants. And a judge rules R. Kelly's illegal marriage to singer Aaliyah can be used against him as evidence in his sex trafficking trial. The shocking allegations ahead of jury selection. Plus, the man accused of fatally shooting a TikTok star and his friend in a movie theater appears in court. What the suspect is now saying in a jailhouse interview. And a criminal complaint is filed against New York's governor, Andrew Cuomo. The allegations of groping and physical touching being called the most egregious against the governor. Cuomo's attorneys now responding. This investigation was conducted in a manner to support a predetermined narrative. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer. Co-host Terry Austin is off. We begin with a major legal development in the doomsday cult couple saga. Prosecutors have announced they are now seeking the death penalty for Chad Daybell. Prosecutors in Fremont County, Idaho, filed their notice to seek the death penalty against Daybell on Thursday. Daybell is facing eight charges in connection to the murder of his first wife, Tammy Daybell, along with the murders of J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan, the children of his current wife, Lori Vallow Daybell. Lori is also charged in the murders, but is deemed incompetent to stand trial for now. Investigators have said the couple was preparing for an end-of-the-world scenario and wanted to rid the world of zombies and the human bodies they inhabit. According to court documents, the murders are especially heinous and the defendant exhibited utter disregard for human life. Daybell's trial is set to begin in November. Joining us today is former federal prosecutor Nima Romani. Now, Nima, the death penalty is being asked for citing Daybell's cruelty, disregard for human life, and danger to society, but also he committed this for some sort of uh, monetary gain. Thoughts on the death penalty and the reasons? Brian, if you believe in the death penalty, this is a death penalty case. What is more cruel and heinous than killing your own children and burying them in your backyard? Clearly, utter disregard for human life. And let's talk about the propensity. I mean, everyone that comes near this doomsday cold couple ends up dead. So regardless of what side you're on, Idaho is a death penalty case, and this is a case that merits it. And the evidence is overwhelming. Frankly, the only question is, what took prosecutors so long to charge these two and announce the death penalty? They really pushed it till almost the last minute. Yeah, so I'm guessing you're not surprised in any way, shape, or form. This is what you expected. Absolutely. There's no question. The only surprise was that it took so long to charge them with the murders and now announce that they're seeking the death penalty. This case does merit it, at least for Chad. Absolutely. That makes sense. And don't forget, he's also being prosecuted for the death of his wife. So with those three, I would agree with you. If you are in support of the death penalty, this would be the type of case. Turning now to California, where a man accused of killing a TikTok star and his friend appears in court after granting a jailhouse interview. Law and Crimes' Anjanette Levy is here with what this defendant told a reporter. Anjanette? Brian, a newspaper quotes Joseph Jimenez as saying that he was diagnosed with schizophrenia eight months ago and never refilled his prescription for his medication. Right now, there is no indication that he knew either one of the people he is accused of killing. Joseph Jimenez appearing in a California courtroom with his attorneys who were less than pleased that a reporter interviewed him in jail. The record should reflect that at no point did we authorize that, approve that, agree with that. Uh, in fact, we've been very clear about making no comments to the press or to anyone in this case. Jimenez is accused of shooting TikTok influencer Anthony Barajas and Riley Goodrich in a Corona, California movie theater that was nearly empty last month. The Riverside Press Enterprise quotes Jimenez as saying, I wish I didn't do it. And the voices said my friends and family were going to be killed. Goodrich died at the theater, but Barajas passed away after being placed on life support. Jimenez faces murder charges with special circumstances, including the fact that multiple murders were committed, and he's being accused of lying in wait. The defendant was concealing his purpose, concealing his or her purpose for what they were doing, and then uh, waited and watched and waited before actually um, making a surprise attack. Questions have also been raised about whether others could be charged, since three witnesses may have seen him leave to retrieve the gun. We've charged the, the accounts in this case that we believe are best supported by the evidence. 
Meanwhile, Jimenez's lawyers were granted an order that allows mental health professionals to see him, but no one else, unless they approve it. They're angry a reporter was allowed to speak with him. We consider a very gross violation of his right to counsel. And Joseph Jimenez is currently being held without bail. He will be arraigned when he is back in court in September. Brian. Thank you, Anjanette. Mima, mental health evaluations and statements made to the press. Are you sensing this could be a case that raises a mental health defense? And also, could the statements he made to the press be used against him? Brian, there's no question this is a mental health case because there's really no defense on the merit. I mean, these are some very damaging admissions that Jimenez made. And I know his defense attorneys are upset. The last thing you want, if you're a criminal defense attorney, is your client to say that I did it and say it in a very public way to the press. But unfortunately for them, there is no defense that this violated the attorney-client privilege. This wasn't law enforcement. This wasn't someone who invoked. And ultimately, the privilege is the client's, and the client is free to waive it to the extent that he or she wants. So you know, I understand why they're not happy, but there is no legal recourse here. Yeah, there seems to be no privilege. And also, I don't see how the Fifth Amendment may apply here either. So those words may come in. And Jeanette, could the defendant face the death penalty? You know, he could, Brian, but a spokesperson for the district attorney said that decision has not yet been made because there are these special circumstances surround surrounding both of the murder charges. He could face the death penalty. These charges are eligible for it. But as we all know, California currently has a moratorium on the death penalty. So we'll just have to wait and see what the DA decides. Absolutely. So with that that uh, moratorium on the death penalty, and Jeanette, so it will be like all the other cases we've seen where they, if they seek it, it may not be executed for lack of a part, uh, better word uh, if he is found guilty, right? Yeah, exactly right, Brian. We've seen that in California where people are sentenced to death and it isn't carried out. And there are years and years of appeals, of course. But if there's a new governor, you never know. There could be a new policy. All right. We'll keep eyes on that case as it progresses. Thank you both. Still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, a criminal complaint now filed against New York's governor, how his attorneys are responding. But first, the start of R. Kelly's trial is right around the corner. How prosecutors are now able to tell the jury about his marriage to beloved singer Aaliyah when she was just 15 years old. Find out after the break. Welcome back. Jury selection in R. Kelly's New York trial is scheduled to begin next week. And now, prosecutors will be allowed to present evidence of the R&B singer's secret marriage to Aaliyah. The hit song by Aaliyah debuted in 1994. It was produced by R. Kelly, and just months later, the two married. But Aaliyah was just 15 years old, and federal prosecutors in New York accused Kelly of bribing an Illinois government employee to obtain a fake ID for Aaliyah. According to court records, that fake ID was used to obtain a marriage license listing her age as 18. Aaliyah died in 2001 in a plane crash. She was just 22 years old. Prosecutors in New York are now calling her Jane Doe No. 1. This week, a judge ruled that evidence showing Kelly had sexual contact with Aaliyah when she was a teenager can be presented to the jury. Prosecutors allege Aaliyah became pregnant and as a result, in an effort to shield himself from criminal charges related to his illegal sexual relationship with Jane Doe No. 1, Kelly arranged a secret marriage to prevent her from being compelled to testify against him in the future. Kelly is facing charges of transporting underage girls across state lines for sexual activity and child pornography. He's pled not guilty. Let's bring back former federal prosecutor Nima Romani. Nima, R. Kelly's marriage to Aaliyah has been whispered for decades. How do you see Kelly's relationship to now Jane Doe number one being used against him in a trial almost 20 years after her death? Brian, prosecutors love this type of 404B or other prior bad acts evidence because it helps dirty up the defendant. Let's not forget that R. Kelly was acquitted back in 2008, the last time he was tried. So the more that you can present this evidence to the jury, it helps dirty up the defendant. We saw the same tactic used both against Bill Cosby and Harvey Weinstein. So that's the what, and that makes sense. But as we know, it's one thing to know something. It's another thing to prove it in court. Do you see any difficulties the prosecution may face in this alleged rape from 1994? Even the district judge in this case asked R. Kelly's defense attorneys, do you dispute that sexual contact occurred when you were married to a 15-year-old? 
I think the jury is going to see right through that argument if R. Kelly's counsel gets up there and says, we were married, but nothing of a sexual nature happened. I don't think that's a particularly good argument, although one I expect them to make. Yeah, I mean, they've got the marriage license, they've got the name, they've got it listed as 18 at the time. That's pretty damning evidence. You think it's a, a non-credible argument to say, hey, we got married, we just slept in separate beds the entire time, and that's not going to fly? I don't think so. I don't think the jury is going to buy the Ricky and Lucy argument with two twin beds, especially when it comes to R. Kelly. I think the more this type of evidence that comes in related to other victims, that is what's going to help the Fed finally convict him. Well, he did write, I believe I, I believe I can fly. I'm not sure if that argument's going to work here, but we'll keep eyes on this case as it begins just around the corner. Two police officers and bystanders who rescued a baby pinned under a car in Yonkers, New York, are recognized for their quick action. Law and Crime's Anjana Levy is back with the ceremony to recognize those involved in the rescue. You know, Brian, it's been about two weeks since that eight-month-old baby girl and her mother were hit by a suspected drunk driver. Now, you may recall surveillance video and also police body camera video captured those horrific tense moments when both of them were hit. They were crossing the street in Ronk Yonkers, rather, when the vehicle crossed the road and smashed them into a storefront. Officers Rocco Fusco and Paul Samayeni were getting breakfast nearby and heard the crash. The officers and three men lifted the car off of the baby and her mother. This week, the city of Yonkers recognized them for their efforts, and the baby's father and the wife of the woman hit became very emotional when he showed up at the ceremony and thanked everyone involved in Spanish for their efforts. The police commissioner also spoke at the ceremony. It's really a recognition and acknowledgement of the, the collaborative effort that they did together. And I just want to, again, echo the mayor's sentiments about Officer Samayedni, Officer Fusco, and then our civilians too, Michael LaRusso, Bar Castillo, and Jose Suero, um, all five who worked together and made sure that they, they literally saved the life of, of Leslie, uh, the little girl, and Mother Myrna. Now, the mother and the daughter who were rescued, they are still in the hospital, but their conditions are improving, um, according to the husband and father and the police commissioner. And the man who hit them faces several charges at this point. Brian. Thank you, Anjanette. Well Well-deserved recognition by all five, and we wish a speedy recovery to both the mother and that young child. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, why one woman is speaking with a sheriff's office over groping allegations by Governor Cuomo. Plus, the shocking news that brings Robert Durst's trial to a halt for now. Why there's a pause in the trial of the real estate heir accused of murder next. Welcome back. Long Crime's Jesse Weber is covering the heartbreaking death of a four-month-old boy and the conviction of his mother on the latest episode of his show, Prime Crime. Hey there, Brian. Yeah, we've covered the deaths of young children before, but the manner in which Sterling Keene died and the condition he was left in, never seen anything like that. Now, the focus would turn on the parents, and we learned a lot, especially when the mother, Cheyenne Harris, spoke with law enforcement. Do you remember putting Sterling in the swing? Yeah. Also, we're going to get into when the father, Zachary Keene, took the stand, and we sit down with the investigator and some of the lawyers from this case. Tune in to Law and Crime. It's never okay to drink and drive, and it's definitely never okay to drink and drive, then crash into a government building. Dan Abrams, Law and Crime founder and host of the a &E series Court Cam, is here to tell us about one man who didn't get the message. Next, we head to the Burke County Courthouse in Morganton, North Carolina. Or, more accurately, the lobby of the courthouse. That's Herbert Bristol getting out of his car. Naturally, after parking his car in a courthouse, he puts on his hazard lights. Here it is from another angle. Bristol, who'd been drinking before the incident, just crashed his car through the entrance of the building. 
no sense of urgency here. Bristol just gets out of his parked car in the lobby of a federal building, lights a cigarette, and begins to walk out. Yes, he's leaving the same way he came in, this time without his car. Ironically, police believe Bristol was already scheduled for a court appearance on drunk driving charges. Thanks to this incident, there would be another court appearance for Bristol on a litany of charges, including failure to report an accident. Despite all the charges that surely awaited him, Bristol didn't seem too concerned. Seems like he was just parking in the wrong spot and got to court a little early. <laughs> when we come back, an appeals court issues their decision on the conviction of ex-cop Amber Geiger for the murder of Botham Jean. Will the jury's guilty verdict be upheld or overturned? Find out after the break. Welcome back. A Texas Court of Appeals is upholding the conviction of former Dallas police officer Amber Geiger for murdering Botham Jean in his apartment. A panel of three judges ruled there was sufficient evidence to convict Geiger of murder. She's now serving a 10-year sentence. Geiger testified at trial that she accidentally entered Jean's apartment thinking it was her own. Prosecutors argued Geiger drew her service weapon intending to shoot Jean dead. An attorney for Jean's family says they're relieved by the court's decision but not shocked. A Tennessee jury has found Stephen Wiggins guilty of fatally shooting a sheriff's deputy and lighting his body on fire. Wiggins admitted to shooting Dickinson County Sheriff Sergeant Daniel Baker in May 2018. A jury convicted Wiggins of all charges, including murder, arson, and impersonating a police officer. The same jury will now hear evidence and recommend to the judge if Wiggins should face the death penalty or spend the rest of his life in prison. Testimony in the penalty phase begins on Saturday. And the trial of Robert Durst abruptly came to a halt on Thursday. We're now learning that's because a member of the public inside the courtroom has tested positive for COVID-19. Testimonies on hold until at least Monday morning. Durst is on trial for the murder of his best friend, Susan Berman, in December 2000. Prosecutors have rested and the defense's memory expert was on the stand. Dr. Elizabeth Loftus was in the middle of day two of a contentious cross-examination by prosecutor John Lewin. Now to a major update in the probe into New York's governor, Andrew Cuomo. A woman who says Cuomo groped her in the executive mansion has filed a criminal complaint with the Albany County Sheriff. The New York Post first reported Friday a woman identified as executive assistant number one is filing the criminal complaint. According to a report by New York's attorney general's office, executive assistant one told investigators the governor grabbed her rear end when asking her to take a selfie. The report said the governor denied touching her backside. Independent investigators spoke with 11 women. The AG's office described the assistant's incident as the most egregious allegations of physical touching. Cuomo's attorneys held a press conference on Friday to deny all allegations, but it didn't go exactly as planned. This investigation was conducted in a manner to support a predetermined narrative. Am I frozen? Okay. Good afternoon. I apologize in advance for the technical, or actually I apologize after the fact for the technical difficulties. Our ethernet went down. Me and my team went through the emails for that day. All the entrance and exit records and this woman's story, which is stated as fact in the report is false. The documentary evidence does not support what she said. And what is disturbing to me is that the two investigators did not show that evidence to you. They ignored it. Ask them why. Nima, why is Executive Assistant One filing a complaint bringing Cuomo closer to charges? Albany already had the AG's report. Brian, another day and more bad news for the current governor, maybe soon to be former governor. This is important because sexual assault is one of the most underreported crimes. As a prosecutor, 
Rarely do you have victims who are ready, willing, and able to come forward and assist with a criminal prosecution. Now that Executive Assistant One has made it clear that she wants to proceed, it's going to make the district attorney of Albany's case that much stronger. Now, Nima, what do you think about the defense so far for the governor and how they laid out this timeline that saying this all doesn't make sense? Well, you have 11 victims here, and the folks who conducted the investigation, one of them is a former federal prosecutor, and the other is a civil employment attorney. Let's not forget, these were employees. So I'm not surprised that the governor's defense team has come out and denied all these accusations. But what's more believable, what's more credible, that 11 victims have come forward and they're all lying, or it's the governor who's denying any responsibility for his conduct? And let's not forget, the reason that executive assistant one came forward is because she was upset that the governor and his defense attorneys have come out and flat out denied any of this conduct. So, Anima, intentionally touching a person for no reason but to, to degrade, abuse, or for sexual gratification. By my read, that's the state law Cuomo could have broken. What do you think? I agree, Brian. And you're certainly you're the expert on New York law being out there, but grabbing someone's buttocks, forcibly groping their breasts, kissing them on the lips, that seems to fall squarely within the four corners of the sexual assault law that you just identified. Yeah, and you better believe that Albany is going to be looking at that and other charges that they could potentially press forward against the governor here to see whether or not any of these charges will stick. Nima, thank you as always for joining us here today and giving us that expert analysis. And thank you for joining us here on Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.